am Larry Groby, and I know many things about the Whistler, for I come from the generic radio workshop. You know a bit about the Whistler, too, don't you? You know that the show was a West Coast mystery about men and women who have stepped into the shadows. You even knew that over 500 episodes from the 1940s and 1950s can still be heard. But some episodes are lost, and you didn't know that, did you? You didn't know that there's a murderous script of the Whistler that hasn't been heard in 70 years. Yes, Project Audion has that script and is going to perform it via transcontinental Zoom transcription. And you're going to have to listen to it now, aren't you? Indeed, stay tuned for The Man from the Morgue. And now, stay tuned for the program that has rated tops in popularity for a longer period of time than any other West Coast program in radio history. The Signal Oil program, The Whistler. Signal, the famous Go Farther Gasoline, invites you to sit back and enjoy another strange story by The Whistler. I am The Whistler, and I know many things, for I walk by night. I know many strange tales hidden in the hearts of men and women who have stepped into the shadows. Yes, I know the nameless terrors for which they dare not speak. And now for the Signal Oil Company, the Whistler's strange story, Man from the Moor. Ross Merrick leaned across his desk, flipped the switch to the intercom, and summoned his secretary. He sat back, relaxing for a moment as he waited for her. He was fortyish, tall, distinguished looking, ideal in appearance for his position of publisher, editor of the little town of Glenview's only newspaper. He seemed calm and self assured as his secretary entered, approached his desk. Yes, Mr. Merrick? I want to give you a few changes in today's editorial, Miss Prentice. Yes, sir. She sits down across the desk from you, doesn't she, Ross? The pencil poised, waiting. And you rise, thoughtfully, move a few steps to the window in the back of your desk. You glance out casually, react startled to something, someone that you see on the street below. <gasps> Herb. Carter. What was that, sir? It's impossible. I, I can't hear you, Mr. Merrick. Mr. Merrick, Mr. Merrick, what is it? Where are you going? Mr. Merrick? The terrible shock, isn't it, Ross? The sight of Herb Carter? And you hurry through the office, bumping people, rushing down the stairs and out into the street, and then... Gone. He's gone. Marion! Marion! Marion, why didn't you answer? Ross, darling, you're home early. How nice. It isn't nice. It isn't nice at all, Marion. He's back. He's found us. Herb Carter. What? 
Oh, but that's not possible, dear. Herb Carter is dead. Marion, I'm trying to tell you, I saw him. Not 20 minutes ago, I saw Herb Carter. He was in front of my office, leaning against a lamppost. I got a very clear look at him. Ross, you're upset. You've been working too hard lately. I tell you, I saw the man. He's back, and you know what that means. I know what it could mean, darling. If the one man who knows you murdered my husband is Marion, we agreed you'd never use those words again. Sorry. Really, Ross, you'd better have a drink. You're terribly on edge. And you're not, I suppose. Two ice cubes, dear, or one. Marion, if it was Herb Carter, if he wasn't killed in that bombing raid eight years ago... I know. It's the same old story. You think I'd relish paying Mr. Carter for his silence? Wasn't I as happy and relieved as you when he died? We only got a report of his death. I know now that we jumped to a conclusion. Here's your drink, darling. You can use one. I guess we both can. Herb Carter is quite dead. Otherwise, he'd have been after us long before this. How? Where would he have looked for us? It could have taken him all this time. After all, he'd have been looking for a man named John Sloan. Oh, dear Johnny. It was such a shame to change your name. Ross Merrick has always seemed so, well, stuffy. Mm, delicious. <laughs> You're not even listening to me. Yes, I am. Let's sit down, dear. Come on. You're a cool one, Marion. I don't know. Of course you don't. Because you let your mind play tricks sometimes. Oh, you've too much of an imagination, darling. You honestly think that... I don't just think. I know that everything is just as it was. Oh, we're going to do all right. We have done all right, haven't we? With my late husband's money. Never mind that. It's been useful, hasn't it? Just as we planned. Oh, let me see. Do we own two or three newspapers? Marion, they're small town papers. But profitable. Oh, and we enjoy this warm small town life. Or are you getting tired of it, darling? And of me? Marion. Kiss me. Darling, I... Mm. Mm. Better? I yes. I don't know. I... Maybe I have been letting my mind run wild. I, I, I don't know. I, I just thought today that... You're probably right. Anyways... I'm going to forget it. There's nothing to forget. Oh, we'd have heard from him long before this. The past is dead too, darling. Oh, and there's a good life. A very good life ahead of us. You tell yourself she's right, don't you, Ross? But your sleep is disturbed that night. And at the next day at the office, you expect the phone to ring and hear Herb Carter's voice at the other end of the wire. But it doesn't happen. Not the next day, or the next. And you become more and more certain that you are imagining things. That the man on the street, Carter, street corner was not Carter. That he's still dead, as once reported, and that you are safe. And then one evening, when you're working late at the office... Hello? Mr. Merrick? Yes? Who is this? An old friend, Mr. Merrick. Oh? <laughs> but I don't... Uh... You don't recognize my voice? No. Well, perhaps if I called you Johnny Sloan. <laughs> Carter? Carter. Yes. <laughs> I'd like to see you, Johnny. Of course. I, uh, I can't make it tonight. Awfully busy. Uh, however, if... I'd like to see you, Johnny. I'd like to see you tonight. But... 
Where shall we make it, Johnny? I, uh, I... All right. My house, 811 Elm Street. 811 Elm. Very good. Meet you there. In half an hour. Half an hour. Yes. It'll be good to see you again. After all this time. My, eight years. It's like, uh, <laughs> almost like coming back from the dead. Isn't it, Johnny? Poor old car, she ain't what she used to be. Ain't what she used to be. <laughs> if you're one of the many drivers who's singing that lament about his car these days, has it ever occurred to you, maybe it's not your car, but what you're putting, what you're feeding it? For instance, if the starting isn't as prompt as it used to be, just try some Signal Ethyl, the premium grade of Signal's famous Go Further Gasoline. See if your motor doesn't spring to life the instant you touch the starter. If the pickup isn't what it used to be, just try Signal Ethel. See if your car doesn't display new pep that makes you proud. And if you're not zooming up the hills as you used to, just try you-know-what. See if Signal Ethel doesn't put back power that sends you soaring smoothly over the summit in high. For after all, Signal Ethel is scientifically engineered to bring out the best in any car of any age. <laughs> Maybe it won't quite turn a vintage model into a new car, but this much is certain. The next best thing to a spankin' new car is your car powered with Signal Ethel. Well, Ross, you were right, weren't you? After all this time, all this freedom, the man who can destroy it all for you has turned up. Herb Carter, the man you believe dead. He's back, isn't he, Ross? You reach for the phone to call your wife Marion. Remember suddenly that she's away at the country club with friends. You'll have to meet Carter alone, won't you? Keep the appointment at your house in half an hour. For a moment you consider running, leaving town, but it's no use. If he's found you after all this time, and you with another name... You tell yourself there's only one thing to do, and you leave the office, hurry the short distance to your home to wait for him. But he's late arriving, isn't he? And your tension mounts until finally you hear the doorbell. Carter, don't lean on the bell. You want to wake the neighbors? <laughs> Wake the neighbors with the doorbell. That's a good one, Johnny. And please stop calling me Johnny. Come on in. I don't know, maybe we shouldn't have met here. What's the matter, Johnny? A little upset? I said come in. Sure, sure. In here, we'll talk in the den. Anywhere you say, pal. Just so we get right to the point. Which is? <laughs> Doe, Johnny. Why do you think I've been... I've, I've been celebrating? Mind telling me how you found me? Not at all. Happy to. Shows I'm still a good newspaper man. Regular hawk. <laughs> you see, when I got back to the States and found that my old buddy, Johnny Sloan, had dropped out of sight, well, I had to do some thinking. I'll bet. So I checked on Marion and found she'd left too. <laughs> you were both so sure I was killed in that raid over there. We read the report. Yes, you thought you were safe, that dead men tell no tales. Well, mistakes were sometimes made, Johnny. Any newspaper man will tell you that. Lots of mistakes. <laughs> <laughs> you were telling me how you... How, how I found you, yes, yes. I got myself assigned to the newspaper morgue back in the old hometown, Johnny. 
all those story files at my disposal, lots of different papers, and finally... Look, you didn't day. see me in any paper. I've been careful. You have, yes, but not Marion. She slipped up, Johnny. Maybe just once, but her picture two weeks ago in a society section as Mrs. Ross Merrick. Well, I know different. I know she was the late Mrs. Kurt Landers, now probably married to Johnny Sloan. And I was so right. <laughs> Mr. and Mrs. Ross Merrick. Nice, solid name you two took. <laughs> <laughs> it's a name you're not going to destroy, Carter. Oh, that depends on you, Johnny. Or maybe I should call you Ross. You made a mistake following us here like this, making this blackmail pitch. Not as big a mistake as you made. Killing Marion's husband? Look, I'm not going to ask too much, Johnny. How... Much. Oh, I don't know. I, um, had in mind becoming a business associate. Help you run the newspapers. <laughs> becoming an associate? Don't make me laugh. Easy, Johnny. The tail's wagging the dog now. Murderers are in no position to dictate You her shouldn't have called me that, Carter. <laughs> oh! Oh! <laughs> You've killed again, haven't you? First for money, now for protection. But it's still the same. You've killed a man, and you've got to get rid of him. Get the silently accusing form at your feet away, out of the house so that you won't be connected with his death. Your mind begins to focus again. You remember that your wife Marion won't be back from the country club for several hours, and you need her help. You don't want to call her at the club. Decide that you must... Wait. Finally, at two o'clock, you can stand the suspense no longer. You reach for the phone and call the club. Country Club. Is, is Mrs. Ross Merrick there? Mrs. Merrick? Uh, one moment. Mrs. Merrick left about an hour ago, sir. An hour? All right. Uh, oh, uh, uh, did you notice who she was with? Uh, one moment. Uh, Mrs. Merrick left with the Wilson party, sir. The Wilsons. Thanks. Hello? Bob, uh, this is Ross Merrick. Uh, yeah, Ross. Uh, I, I, was, I was asleep. Oh, sorry, I I've been trying to locate Marion. Isn't she home yet? She dropped Betty and me off, went on with the Hartleys. Uh, uh, just a minute. Ross? Ross? Yes. Betty says Marion and the Hartleys were going on to that hamburger place down the highway from you. Probably still there, huh? Yeah. Yeah, probably still there. Uh, thanks, Bob. It's all right. Why don't you all go back to sleep? She'll be okay. Uh, yeah, good idea. I'll... Go on to sleep. The panic within you builds with each passing minute, doesn't it, Ross? And you continue to pace your living room. Finally, you hear Marion pull into the driveway alongside the house. You hurry out of the garage. Quickly tell Marion what's happened. She's... Very calm, as always. All right. Is he still in the house? Of course. How did you expect me to get him? We'll get him away. 
out into the country somewhere. We've got to hurry. It'll be daylight soon. Oh, I'll back the car up to the side entrance, and then No, we can't bring him out this way. The light from next door. What? Ah, yes. Mrs. Kramer. She's kept those floodlights on for ever since that burglary a week ago. Look, Marion, you back out... Drive around the block and come up the alley in the back of the Benson's place. I'll meet you there with Carter's body in five minutes. Right. Be careful. Inside the house, you pick up Carter's body. Slip out your front door. Move cautiously in the darkness along the hedge towards the Benson's house on the other side. You can reach the alley that way, can't you, Ross? And then... Someone is out there on the sidewalk, Ross, where they can see you. You peer through an opening in the hedge, and in the light of the street lamp, you see a youngster sitting on the curb. It's Jimmy Weller, one of your newsboys. He's folding his newspapers for the morning delivery, and you know you've got to wait till he moves away. You stand there in the darkness, and as the minutes go by, your arms begin to ache under the weight of Carter's body. And then finally... The newsboy is gone now, Ross. And you can continue along the hedge, thankful for the pitch darkness. You drop down quickly as a car pulls up near the Benson's house. (laughs) (laughs) Such a good night. (laughs) Uh, Thanks for driving us home, Henry. Benson's their back. The panic is with you again, isn't it, Ross? As you crouch behind the hedge, Carter's body sprawled out beside you. Marion is waiting with the car in the nearby alley, but you can only reach it alongside the Benson's house. And as the minutes go by, they're still close by, chatting with their friends, blocking your progress. Oh my, what a party. Oh, Emily, didn't you think Christine's gown was stunning? Oh, I swear, I've never seen that woman in the same dress twice. (sighs) Well, I suppose we should go in. Oh my goodness, I didn't realize it was so late. Come on, Dolly, you and Emily can phone one another. All right, my folks. Glad that club affair only comes once a year. Oh, but you enjoyed yourself, didn't you? Sure, sure, but why do we have to stay out so late? Oh, don't be grumpy now. I... Oh, dear. Now what? My compact. I dropped it. Oh, great. Where? Well, I heard it hit the walk. I think it rolled along the hedge. Leave it. We'll look for it in the morning. We'll do no such thing. Run up to the house, dear, and turn on the porch light. (sighs) All right. The moment that porch light is turned on, you'll be seen, won't you, Ross? And suddenly you make a decision, the only one you can make. You put Carter's body down, leave it there, and hurry back to your house. to you. I didn't dare wait any longer. I couldn't reach the alley. The Bensons came home. I know. I saw the light. But you had plenty of time before that. What kept you? Jimmy Weller. Jimmy Weller? One of my delivery boys. He was out there folding his papers. At this time of the morning? I thought he didn't come around until 6.30. He used to, but... But what? Well, last week I moved the schedule up an hour. I thought our subscribers would appreciate a little... Well, that was certainly a smart move. Okay, so it's all my fault, but how was I supposed to... Wait a minute. What did you do with Carter? He's out there on the Benson lawn. What? I had to leave him there. Benson went into the house to turn on the porch light. I'd have been seen. Oh, Ross. Now, look, Marion... 
There's nothing to worry about. No one's going to tie us up with Carter. We never saw him before, understand? All right. And, but there's still... And listen. I have an idea. I've been figuring it out. Something to keep the police occupied. A suspect. What? Why not? If they're busy looking for a man they think is the murderer, they won't be asking too many questions. You'll see, Marion. It'll work. It'll work just fine. <laughs> All right, folks, let the boys through. Let them through. And please, if you'll all go back to your homes. Oh, morning, Mr. Merrick. Morning, Sheriff. I suppose you'll be wanting the facts for your paper. Yes, but I think I can be of some help to you, Sheriff. Oh, that's so. I think I may have seen the murderer. What? Last night, or should I say early this morning, I was in my study reading. As you can see, the windows overlook the lawn here. And go on. Well, I heard voices, men's voices, uh, seemed to be some sort of a heated discussion. I, I looked out the window, saw two men standing, well, uh, let me see, uh, about there on the sidewalk. Oh, what'd they look like? One of them was tall, broad-shouldered, the other one was quite small, mm -hmm. slender. I he was facing the streetlight. I, I might be able to recognize him. Oh, will you uh, step over this way, Mr. Merrick? Of course. Uh, lift the blanket off the body, will you, Jess? Well, Mr. Merrick? I'm not positive, but I think that's him. Do you remember how the other man was dressed? Well, let me see. Uh, dark trousers, I think. A jacket of some sort. No hat. Uh, I see, I see. Uh, go on. Well, I went back to my reading and... Some time later, I looked out again and saw the tall man get into a car. Mm. Uh, it had been parked at the curb. Ah, what kind of a car? Oh, I didn't notice the make. Uh, it was a sedan, though. Uh, dark. Uh, and the other man? I didn't see him. And what time of morning was this, Mr. Merrick? Around two, I think? Uh, yes, I, I remember because I looked at my watch frequently. Uh, you see, my wife was at the country club, and I was expecting her home anymore. Oh, I see, I see. Yes, well, uh, thanks a lot, Mr. Merrick. Uh, we'll go to work on this right away. Darling, Sheriff Wade is here. Oh, uh, have him come in, Marion. Sheriff? Ah, oh, good evening, Mr. Merrick. Evening, Sheriff. And you know my deputy, Jess Anderson? Well, of course. Well, I hope we're not disturbing you. No, no, just puttering around my desk. I'm always bringing work home from the office. Mm. You gentlemen care for some coffee? Oh, thanks, no, Mrs. Merrick. We just stopped by for a minute. How are you making out with that lead I gave you this morning? Well, we're working on it. Coroner's report fixed time of death around 2 a.m. That fits in with what you saw, Mr. Merrick. Uh, death was instantaneous. A blow on the back of the head. I see. Uh, find out anything about the dead man? Oh, not much, not much. Uh, came to town two days ago, registered at the Dalton Hotel, said he was from San Francisco. You got a good look at him this morning, Mr. Merrick. You ever seen him before? Why, no. You positive? Of course. Why? Well, I had a talk with the desk clerk at the Dalton. He told me that Carter asked him how to get out here. Here? You mean to my house? Uh-huh, yeah. Apparently he was on his way here when he was killed. I wonder why. Uh, hard to say. Uh, we'll probably never know now. I'll get it, dear. Well, I don't want to take up any more of your time, Mr. Merrick. Just check it in, that's all. Of course. Uh, you'll let me know if anything turns up? Oh, sure will. It's for you, Sheriff. Your office. Oh? oh? Well, thanks, Mrs. Merrick. Hello? Yeah. When? Uh-huh. Okay, just a minute. You want something, Sheriff? Uh, slip a paper if you have one. Oh, right there on the desk. The pad. Oh, okay. Thank you. Uh, okay, Bill, let's have it. Uh-huh. Yeah, okay. San Francisco? Okay. Yeah, I'll get on it. 
I'll take the midnight train, yeah. Well, how do you like that for a break? What is it, Sheriff? Oh, boys at headquarters just got a phone call from a woman in San Francisco. Wouldn't give her name, just an apartment number and an address. Oh? That's about the dead man, Carter. She said she could tell us why Carter came to this town. I, I, I see. Well, that certainly is uh, a break, isn't it? Yeah. Might just put the finger on the man who killed Carter. Your knees almost fold under you, don't they, Ross? And you lean back, grip the edge of your desk until the knuckles show white. He watches the sheriff hands the slip of paper to his deputy, watch the deputy copy the address down in a little black notebook, then he crumples the slip of paper, throws it into your wastebasket. Then after the sheriff and the deputy have gone... That woman, Ross. Who could she be? Friend of Carter's, probably. What are we going to do? The only thing we can do, stop her from talking. But how will you know where to find her? Well, thanks to the sheriff's deputy, the answer lies right here in the wastebasket. Yes, here we are. Apartment 301, Forest Avenue. Marion, I'll drive the car around. You phone the depot. I'll find out what time the sheriff's train gets to San Francisco. Uh, he's taking the midnight. With luck, I might get there before he does. Ordinarily, it's a two-hour drive to San Francisco, isn't it, Ross? But you make it in an hour and 45 minutes. A full hour before the sheriff's train is due to arrive. And you... Hurry to the apartment on Forest Avenue. Yes? How do, how do you do? Uh, I'm Sheriff Wade. Uh, you called my office earlier this evening? Oh, uh, yes. Yes, come in. You, uh, you alone? Quite alone. Please sit down. Thanks. No, I won't be here very long. Suit yourself, but... <gasps> Wait a minute! What's the idea of the gun? Am I under arrest? No, you're not under arrest. Okay, so you don't have to wave that gun around. I said I'd talk, tell you everything I know. Sure, you'll tell everything you know, but you know too much. Do you follow me, sister? <laughs> Warning to drivers, automobile accidents skyrocket during rainy weather. So, if a worn windshield wiper is blurring your vision, or if your tires are dangerously smooth and skiddy, don't put off doing something about it. Better head for your nearest signal station now. While you wait, your signal dealer can install the famous patented ClearFlex Rainmaster wiper blade. And he can replace your slippery old tires with quick-stopping, skid-resistant new Lee tires. Because the cold rubber in nationally renowned Lee tires is now toughened still further with patented Phil Blacko. Today's Lees wear amazingly long, yet the generous trade-in signal dealers are giving for old tires makes new Lees cost gratifyingly little. And liberal credit terms are available. So whatever your car needs for safer winter driving, whether it's tires, battery, spark plugs, light bulbs, fan belt, or radiator hose, remember... Your nearest headquarters for a complete line of quality automobile accessories is your nearest signal service station. It'll all be over soon, won't it, Ross? Yes. You've only to pull the trigger now. Silence the woman who stands before you. We're certain that she knows that Herb Carter was murdered because he tried to blackmail you, and that you are the murderer. But she'll never be able to tell the police that, will she? No. You're... Merrick. Ross Merrick, aren't you? That's right. You killed Herb? <laughs> You're right again, sweetheart. That's all we wanted to hear, Merrick. What... 
Sheriff Wade? Drop it. Drop the gun. Surprised to see me? <laughs> no, I didn't wait to take the midnight. We flew in ahead of you, Ross. Oh, this... It was all a trap? Uh-huh. Well, this young lady happens to be a policewoman, Merrick. That phone call to your house? The slip of paper in the wastebasket? Yeah, a trap. We set it up and you walked right into it. But I don't understand. How could you have guessed? Well, I figured you lied about what happened outside your window last night. What made you think that? Your own newspaper tripped you up, Merrick. My newspaper? Well, Carter was killed at 2 o'clock, all right. But I knew it didn't happen out there on the Benson's front lawn. He was killed somewhere else, and the body was dumped there behind the hedge several hours later. Sometime after 5.30. But how, how could you know that? Well, when we arrived at the scene, we found the morning edition of your newspaper neatly folded under Carter's body. That meant the body had been placed there after the newsboy delivered the paper. Had the body been there since 2 o'clock, as you tried to make us believe, the newspaper, when thrown by the delivery boy, would have landed on top of the body. Right, Mr. Merrick? Let that whistle be your signal for the Signal Oil Program, The Whistler, each Sunday night at this same time. To men over 17, the National Guard suggests you find out how you can meet your military obligations this pleasant way. Train with your hometown buddies, learn new skills, and enjoy sports while you live at home and get a day's regular pay for each two-hour drill period. For more information, inquire at the nearest National Guard headquarters. Featured in tonight's story were Bill Foreman as The Whistler, Joseph Kearns, Alice Reinhardt, Elizabeth Root, Jay Novello, and Bill Bouchy. The Whistler was produced and directed by George W. Allen, with story by Steve Hampton. Music by Wilbur Hatch and was transmitted overseas by the Armed Forces Radio Service. The Whistler is entirely fictional, and all characters portrayed on The Whistler are also fictional. Any similarity of names or resemblances to persons living or dead is purely coincidental. Remember to tune in at this same time next Sunday when the Signal Oil Company will bring you another strange story by The Whistler. That wraps up another Project Audion recreation. We hope it thrilled you a little and chilled you a little. If so, let us know. Better still, let someone else know. Share this Project Audion show on social media or with your real-life friends. Until next time, thanks for listening. Beautiful one. I want to hear the Whistler. I want to hear everybody do the Whistler chorus real quick. Ready? Whoops. (laughs) 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 I hope my whistle. I hope my whistle was good enough for you guys.